We are live, Your Honor. Okay, hey, thank you. Good evening. The meeting of the New York City Council will please come to order. In accordance with Assembly Bill 361, we are conducting this meeting by teleconference. Council members and staff are participating from remote locations since the City Council chambers are closed. The public may watch the meeting live via Zoom or YouTube. Details for each of these options are available on the last page of the agenda. Public comments may be submitted via email to city.clerk at newark.org. Please include the item number in the subject line and the phrase for the record if you want the email read aloud at the meeting. Emails must be received prior to the closure of public comment for the item. For those participating via Zoom, when we get to the item that you wanna speak on, please use the raise your hand feature and the city clerk will turn on your microphone to speak at the appropriate time. Comments shall not exceed five minutes per speaker, including email comments that are read aloud and must be consistent with current speaker rules and all applicable laws. Email comments that cannot be completed within five minutes will be read up until the five minute mark and the remainder of the email will be submitted for the official record. The city clerk will call the roll for all votes tonight. City Clerk Harrington, please call the roll for tonight's attendance. Council members Bucci. Oh, sorry, here. Coyazo. Here. Freitas. Present. Vice Mayor Hannon. Here. Mayor Nagy. Here. All present. Okay, thank you. So item B is presentations. And the first item on the agenda is a presentation from Union Sanitary District General Manager, Paul Eldridge. Mr. Eldridge. For the question I asked Paul. Yeah, good evening, uh, Mayor and Council members. Thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to present to you this evening. I've got a brief PowerPoint presentation for you, so I'm going to try to share my screen, so bear with me one moment. Okay, hopefully you can see the presentation on the screen now. Okay. So um, again, thank you again for the opportunity to present this evening. It's uh, been a while since uh, we've uh, been over at uh, the city of Newark to give you an update as to what USD has been up to. The uh, point of this presentation is to just give you a brief overview of the district, a little bit of background for those of you who uh, may not be familiar with who USD is and what we, <clears throat> excuse me, what we do. Uh, and then uh, what we've been up to uh, here at the district since we last spoke. So with that, I'll go ahead and start the presentation. So a little background on USD, our service area and directors, uh, we provide service, uh, wastewater collection, treatment and disposal to Union City, Fremont and Newark. Uh, we have uh, independent elected board of directors, uh, Manny Fernandez who represents Union City, your very own Pat Kite who represents Newark, Anjali Lothi, Tom Hanley and Jennifer Toy who represent individual parts of Fremont. Some district demographics. Uh, we're about 60 square miles in area for a service area. Again, we serve Fremont, Newark, and Union City, which is about 350, uh, 357,000 residents, 3,000, just a little over 3,000 businesses, <clears throat> about 118, almost 119 total service connections, uh, 17,300 manholes. Uh, and 89 permitted industries. And a permitted industry is a large industry that requires its own permit from USD uh, and have pretreatment programs. So for example, Tesla Motors, LAM Research, US Pipe, Western Digital, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, some statistics about the district. We have 839 miles of pipeline, seven pump stations, one treatment plant here in Union City. It's about 33 acres in size. We treat about 8.34 billion gallons with a B, billion, gal billion, gallons, billion gallon, gallons annually. That is hard to say, apparently. Um, we have an average daily flow rate of about 22.8 million gallons. Uh, we have a permitted capacity of 33 million gallons of uh, treatment capacity. Uh, we've been officially reused about 20,000 wet pounds of biosolids per year and recycle about 365 million gallons of water here on site for our industrial uses at the treatment plant site. 
So some emerging trends that have been affecting uh, wastewater agencies, you may have heard this across the country and it's uh, starting to hit a little closer to home, uh, having to do with nutrients and water bodies. And um, some of the examples to hear of is Lake Erie, um, more closer to home, uh, Discovery Bay had some issues with uh, nutrients and, and really the outcome of the nutrients is uh, how harmful algal blooms. And this is something that uh, is of concern for the San Francisco Bay. Uh, the San Francisco Bay has had a long history of high nutrient loading, uh, but there's been various factors that it really has not been a cause for concern. <clears throat> However, things are changing in the Bay and, and it's starting to become an area of concern and something that uh, not all, the, the wastewater agencies and the State Water Resources Control Board are paying a little bit more attention to uh, because there is a concern that the bay could reach a tipping point and can start to um, suffer from these harmful algal blooms. Uh, so what are we doing? Uh, my U Union Sanitary District is one of the 37 regional wastewater agencies that have been contributing to science research to increase the understanding of how nutrient levels impact the water quality of the bay, um, what sort of nutrient loadings can the bay assimilate or handle, um, we've been doing it in cooperation with the state's regional water board and the EPA, <clears throat> and those, both of those entities will use this additional scientific research that the 37 agencies um, have been funding to develop nutrient strategies and management policies. And we anticipate that one of those uh, management policies and strategies will be uh, nutrient limits at wastewater treatment plants. Uh, the map here on the left, hopefully on the left of your screen, and each of the yellow dots represents one of the 37 agencies uh, that are participating in the science and end up discharging directly to the bay. So what is USD doing? Well, we've been doing a lot of infrastructure program planning. Uh, we've been uh, doing a lot of planning um, throughout the history of the district, but really in earnest since 2015. Uh, the year-long efforts of infrastructure evaluation and looking at what our current needs are and what we think the needs of all of the communities we serve, as well as any impending regulatory requirements that might be coming, uh, has led us to develop what we call the Enhanced Treatment and Site Upgrade Program Report. It's a large, comprehensive capital improvement program. It's the largest in the district's history. And it really provides a roadmap for the district's infrastructure for about the next 40 to 50 years. And this uh, program report uh, outlines a combination of retrofitting, upgrading and relocating existing facilities, construction of new processes, buildings, and upgrading the plant to be able to treat the uh, wastewater for uh, current and anticipated regulations that might be coming. And then we're also phasing it in over a period of time to make sure uh, we get maximum efficiency and cost control uh, out of the program. Um, the program also looks at the collection system, the transport system. It's not unique just to the treatment plant. Um, our capital program uh, covers all of the district's assets, but the enhanced treatment and site upgrade program is specific to the treatment plant. <clears throat> So what does that enhanced treatment and site upgrade program look like? Well, it's broken up into four phases. Uh, the map in front of you outlines the four phases. Phase 1A and phase, there's really two components of phase 1A. Uh, the campus building, the aeration basin modification. The aeration basin modifications is sort of the heart and soul of the work that we're doing here. That's where the uh, most of the treatment of the wastewater actually takes place, and the district is proud to announce that we awarded the construction contract for that project uh, earlier this month. Uh, then we have phases 1B and 1C, and I'll talk a little bit more about the campus component of phase 1A here shortly. So during the evaluation of our infrastructure, we started looking at the buildings that we have here on site a maintenance building, an operations building, and the administration building, which houses various uh, components such as engineering, finance, HR, uh, environmental compliance, and customer service. Um, <clears throat> whether due to age or other issues, we were evaluating whether or not we needed to replace or retrofit 
each of these three buildings. Um, again, they don't meet seismic codes. Um, we have some environmental conditions with the buildings. Uh, in other words, uh, the roof leaks and water gets into the structural members. Um, and we also have space constraints. A lot of these buildings don't meet our current needs, especially operations and maintenance buildings. Uh, so well before we started looking at the infrastructure at the treatment plant, we evaluated the buildings and at the, uh, after a thorough assessment, it was determined that <clears throat> combining all of these functions under one roof uh, and building a new building was more cost effective than either building three new buildings or retrofitting the existing buildings. Uh, the retrofitting of the existing buildings uh, got to be very costly because of the new energy and building codes that we would have to adhere to. And you were completely starting over in a lot of the electrical and mechanical equipment. There wasn't a lot of it that could be reused. And again, this analysis was independent of the needs of the treatment, uh, uh, the treatment train here at the uh, treatment plant. Uh, here's an idea of what we anticipate that the campus building is going to look like. Um, it will comply with all current codes. It will provide seismic and sea level rise resiliency. Uh, we're hoping it includes solar and EV charging, hoping because we're looking for <clears throat> grant funding or uh, low, um, low cost financing for those aspects of the project. Um, and again, we're gonna relocate and consolidate our operations, maintenance and administration functions uh, which allows for optimal operation and layout of future treatment plant processes. Because you may not have uh, noticed uh, in this picture, which will become more apparent later, these buildings are not what you would call in the most optimal location for uh, future upgrades to the treatment plant. So I've got a, I've got a quick video I'm going to play here for you. It's only about four and a half to five minutes. Uh, and uh, hopefully it'll play here shortly. For over a century, Union Sanitary District has protected both the environment and public health in the Tri-City area by safely returning treated wastewater back to the environment. This may sound simple, but it requires carefully managing a complex network of pipes, pumps, and large-scale machinery, totaling nearly $700 million in assets. Although our infrastructure is well-maintained, portions of the Alvarado treatment plant in Union City date back to the 1960s. To maintain our high level of service, we are embarking on a comprehensive capital improvement program that will serve as our roadmap for the next 40 years of reliable, cost-effective operations. The Enhanced Treatment and Site Upgrade Program, or ETSU, is the largest and most extensive improvement program in our history. Over the next several years, the program will progress in three phases and will include upgrades to many parts of the Alvarado plant to renew aging infrastructure, improve water quality in the bay through enhanced wastewater treatment, and increase the resiliency of our facility. When we talk about treating wastewater, we're talking about removing substances through a series of physical, biological, and chemical processes. This can include removing large materials like flushable wipes, all the way down to microscopic organisms and nutrients like nitrogen. Nitrogen is a naturally occurring nutrient that can cause algae to grow faster than ecosystems can handle impacting water quality and decreasing oxygen that fish and other aquatic life need to survive. Historically, the bay has been naturally resilient to nutrient-related problems, but recent studies indicate that this resilience may be declining. Every day, the Alvarado plant receives more than 10,000 pounds of nitrogen and ammonia from our 356,000 service area population. Once the ETSU program is complete, we'll be able to reduce nitrogen by 50% and ammonia by 90% before releasing treated water into the bay. Phase 1A has two components. The first consists of modifications to the plant's existing aeration basins and the addition of a new basin. Aeration basins are large tanks that use powerful blowers and diffusers to pump a high volume of oxygen through wastewater to enhance the bacterial population, also known as bugs in the industry. The bugs use the oxygen to thrive, and organic materials in wastewater as food. The basins accelerate this natural process, breaking down those materials and enabling us to treat vast quantities of waste reliably, quickly, and efficiently. The second component of Phase 1A will include constructing a new campus building within the plant, comprised of operations, maintenance, and administration. 
It will be more resilient to sea level rise and built to seismic code to ensure our facilities stay up and running 24-7. Placing the new campus building in this location optimizes the layout of the treatment process and reduces the amount of energy needed to pump waste and solids throughout the facility during treatment, leading to less energy usage and lower costs. In Phase 1B, we'll construct secondary clarifiers, a pump station, and a disinfection facility. Each clarifier is the size of a half a football field and 20 feet deep. They're used downstream of the aeration basins, aiding the treatment process by removing any solids that can either float or settle out via gravity. Along with the clarifiers, we're also constructing a new pump station that returns those hungry bugs back to the aeration basins, further enhancing the removal of nutrients like nitrogen and protecting our process. The new disinfection facilities work in tandem with the pump station and clarifiers to ensure that we can continue to safely discharge clean water to the bay. Phase 1C will convert the existing secondary clarifier tanks to an equalization basin. Equalization basins hold the wastewater that flows into the plant at varying rates, then pump it out as a steady rate to provide a stable flow of wastewater through the treatment process. This is especially important during heavy rainfall or storms when the flow coming into the plant can vary. Equalized flow allows us to use less power for treatment and minimize operating costs. If you think this sounds like a huge job, you're right. But our highly skilled employees are constantly working to carry out our mission while providing our customers with the lowest possible rates. The ETSU program includes only the most critical projects needed for our system and we examined many options to ensure the best value. The phases of the program over the next seven to 10 years have been prioritized for maximum performance, efficiency, and cost control. Our local natural habitats depend on healthy waterways and a thriving bay. The environment we live in and enjoy every day means as much to us as it does to you, and we are proud to have a leadership role in protecting it. The ETSU program will mean we can continue to protect public health, provide the best possible service to the Tri-Cities, and keep protecting our precious home for generations to come. To learn more about the ETSU program, please visit our website. All right, um, thank you for the opportunity to share that video with you. We, um, ended up developing it because we kept trying to explain the scope and scale of this project to folks. And the best answer we had was, uh, well, the project's really big. And that really didn't uh, do anything for folks. And so we thought maybe providing some scale uh, via uh, a short video would be a good idea. So the idea what came up with uh, maybe overlaying a football field and then the, the video just kind of grew from there. And, and anyway, so that's the end result. <clears throat> Summarizes the project fairly nicely. And uh, a couple of things that I'll uh, mention and reiterate. Um, the, the total cost of the program is anticipated to be about 509 million. Um, as the video stated, uh, we anticipate construction will be nonstop for seven to 10 years. Uh, we're hoping to start that this year. As I mentioned, we awarded the construction contract for the aeration based and modification portion of the project uh, earlier this month. Um, and what are some additional benefits of the ETSU program? Like what, did, what else are we getting out of this program in addition to what we've already mentioned? So it does provide additional uh, reliable and resilient wet weather management. When it rains, our flows go up and we need a place to put that water. And we need to be able to do so uh, reliably uh, and something that's resilient. In other words, uh, it's robust. It's going to uh, put up with uh, heavy flows in the event it ever does rain in California again. Um, it makes us an early adopter of nutrient removal. As we said, we anticipate there'll be future regulations for nutrients. We'll already be there because we'll be, have already started the nutrient removal process through this program. Whenever we talk about reclaimed water, uh, we always talk about water quality. The ETSU program will produce better water quality than we're producing now. So in a lot of ways, we look at this as the first phase of uh, reclaimed water. And it's an initiative that ourselves, USD and ACWD have been partnering and discussing and doing feasibility studies for some time now. And we are in the middle 
of a feasibility study uh, right now to look at, uh, are there ways to reuse this water? Um, and the USD has and will continue to search for funding sources to uh, offset the impacts of the ratepayers, as I mentioned. It's a fairly significant uh, capital program. Uh, the ETSU program alone is about 509 million, as I mentioned. But our total 20 year capital program is about $1.16 billion. So we have a lot of capital needs and it's always uh, first and foremost on our mind to minimize those impacts on our ratepayers. We uh, want to be able to be good stewards of the funds that we receive and we take our fiduciary responsibilities quite seriously. Uh, and again, we're always looking for opportunities to beneficially reuse treated wastewater. So with that, again, I thank you for your uh, time this evening, the opportunity to attend your uh, council meeting and give a quick update on USD. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that uh, any of you may have. Thank you, Mr. Eldridge. Uh, first of all, ask City Clerk Harrington, do we have any public comments? We do have a hand raised, um, but I just want to say for AC, this public comment is just for Union Sanitary District presentation. So if you, okay, okay, he lowered his hand um, or she, no public comment, Your Honor, for this item. Okay, uh, then council comments. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Council Member Coyazo. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for, for such a, a wonderful presentation, Mr. Eldridge. You know, we're so used to um, just having our water. We come home, turn on our faucet, we wash our hands, we cook, we shower. <clears throat> There's so many countries where they don't have that option. They have to go to the river or, or to a well and bring a bucket of water to their home to use for, for their necessities. But um, my question was about these nutrients. We're putting the nutrients in, in the water, is that right? Um, that's one way to put it, yes. I would say, um human beings are little nutrient factories. And uh, yes, the contributions we all make to the sewer system is where the nutrients come from. Okay, so the nitrogen, what is it that produces nitrogen? I, I, I don't know. Well, um, there's a lot of nitrogen in the solid matters that end up in the sewer lines and the treatment plants. Um, a lot of the ammonia comes from the, the liquid side of things, if you will. Okay. Uh, but, the, but the nitrogen is predominantly uh, one of the byproducts of the natural process your body goes through. Okay. Yes. I'm trying to think of a nice way to put it. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> I, I, I didn't know if it was that we were uh, throwing medications into our toilets or, you know, where all this uh, <laughs> was coming from. So with this new system that you're putting in on the A1, the ammonia was going to be like 90% and the nitrogen removal was only going to be 50%. Is there, there's not a way of doing 90% on both? Yes, there is. And um, it would require additional aeration basin tanks to further reduce the nutrient limits, which we have plans that we may need a, another phase down the road to add more facilities to further reduce the, uh, the nitrogen. Uh, and that will be dependent upon if we end up getting um, permit limits or the state says you can only discharge so much nitrogen at the back end of the plant. So, that's a future phase. And again, the reason we're not doing it now <clears throat> is it would be even more expensive and we don't know to what limit we'd be building and we wouldn't want to overbuild or underbuild. So we're doing uh, this first step, which sets us up for the future. 
uh, we can expand the plan and add additional nutrient reduction in the future, but very good question. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vice Mayor Hannon. Yeah, Paul, thank you for the report and thank you for the work that you and your staff do. Um, it, it's one of the more essential services that we provide to our community. And I wanna let you know that your efforts and your staff's efforts are greatly appreciated. I'm excited about ETSU coming down the uh, coming down the road. Uh, my only two questions really quickly are, uh, would our citizens in Newark anticipate or can they ex anticipate any kind of a service hiccup from as you transition from the current facility to ETSU? And then secondly, if you could just describe briefly the rate structure for our residents in Newark, how that's calculated and what they can anticipate over the next few years. Thank you. Um, sure, no, good questions. Uh, so the, the, to your first question, there will be no service impacts related to the ETSU program. Uh, one of the reasons why this job's taking as long to, as it is, <clears throat> and the reason why it's so complicated is because we have to keep the existing plant running while we uh, basically build a new plant around it. And a lot of metaphors are used around this sort of work. Um, changing the oil on your car as you're driving down the freeway is one that gets used a lot, but that's the, essentially what we're doing. So no, we don't anticipate any service interruptions. You won't, shouldn't notice any difference in the services we provide. Um, regarding the rate structure, um, so the rates for, the residential rates for all of the cities that we serve are the same. <clears throat> and we go ahead and we calculate rates uh, using what we call a cost of service analysis. The district for all intents and purposes is a nonprofit. In other words, we can only charge what it costs us to provide the service. Um, so we take what it, our cost, what it's going to cost us to provide the service operations and capital and whatnot. <clears throat> and we uh, go ahead and we figure out what the proportionate share of those costs are between our different customer classes, residential, multifamily, industrial, commercial, and so forth and so on. Each one of those have a different rate structure, as I'm sure you can imagine. The wastewater flow and strength, i.e. the amount of solids and nutrients and nitrogen, which are harder to treat, produced by a residential customer is fairly consistent compared to an industrial user. So we have a different structure for industrial users versus residential. Uh, it goes into a fairly complex formula and out comes the rates that are needed to support the operations of the district. We normally do five-year rate studies. The last time the district did a rate study was in 2020, where we had a fairly large rate increase, but it was to support these capital programs we're talking about. In fact, more than half of that rate increase was to support these capital programs. So I know nobody likes a rate increase. We don't like a rate increase. They're not fun for anybody. They are a necessity, unfortunately, and hopefully our customers can see that we're taking those funds that they entrusted to us and we're putting them to good use and doing what we said we were going to do with them uh, with the SETSU program, for example. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Any other uh, council comments, questions? Mr. Mayor, real quick. Uh, yes, Council okay. Member. Oh, you got me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Thank you, Paul. You know what? Uh, Vice Mayor Hannon touched on the rate question I had, but you know, I've been actually kind of watching this project develop for a while and I've been out there uh, a few times and have gotten to check out the plant. And um, I heard a rumor that there was going to be a cogen upgrade as part of this project. Is that not happening or is that down the road or? No, good question. Um, so, it's sort of happening. That's not a great answer, I guess. Um, we're doing two things. Uh, we are evaluating the current cogen system. And for those of you who don't know, what is meant by cogen is we take um, gas. One of the byproducts of our process is uh, biogas or methane. We collect that, we clean it up, we put it into an engine and we generate electricity. Um, <clears throat> So we're looking at two components. One is upgrading the electrical generation component of the cogen, but we also at some point in the future wanna look at generating more biogas so we can 
have more engines running on biogas and generate more electricity. We're evaluating each one independently, um, but specifically to your question, they are separate and apart from the ETSU program, but they are included in our overall capital improvement program. Nice, happy to hear that. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, thank you, good question. Thank you, Council Member Bucci. Any other questions from the council? No. Okay, again, thank you very much for the presentation. <coughs> Okay, the next item is, uh, is public comment. And uh, this is for any items that not listed on the agenda and public comments are limited to five minutes per speaker. So City Clerk Harrington, do we have any public comments this evening? We do, Your Honor. Okay. AC, you have five minutes. Uh, before I start my five minutes, because we're on Zoom, how many people are attending this meeting? 49. Okay, good. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Alan Chi, and I'm a resident of New York. I am against a proposal for 60 units of permanent homeless housing on Cedar Boulevard. This project is in the middle of homes, schools, daycares, and small businesses. This is not the right location. To be clear, I support low-income housing or even housing for those recently homeless who had lost their jobs. I am against people who are the forever homeless, those that cannot or will not hold a steady job. These people attract trouble and make neighborhoods unpleasant and dangerous. In San Francisco just last week, a homeless man overdosed and passed out at the library. His large dog threatened patrons and attacked a security guard who was just trying to wake him. By the way, that took taxpayer money to fund the library that no one else wants to use, to fund the security guard that was hurt and tied up an ambulance to deal with the overdose. These people don't belong in a shelter near other families in the shelter and their kids. They belong in an addiction hospital. The other side might say that the permanent shelter will evict these bad tenants. Yes, they will be evicted right onto our streets. I just checked this morning and the abode services off of Brown Road in Fremont has broken RVs and garbage thrown across half the block. Remember, it only took one person to ruin the library experience for everyone else. And a problematic issue is that this incident is difficult to record as a statistic. How do you capture the trauma to patrons and guards and the fact that people no longer feel safe to use the library? If it weren't for the dog attack, it probably wouldn't have even been reported. After talking with many in the community, there are two basic schools of thought about homeless shelters. Are they good because they take homeless off the streets or are they bad because they provide free services that attract more homeless? From my experience, the second is more accurate. The more services the city provides to the homeless, the more homeless come. This is based off life experience going to college in Berkeley, living in Hayward, and working in San Francisco for more than a decade. About a decade ago in San Francisco, there were 4,000 homeless. According to the Department of Homelessness, there are now 8,000, and the city spends about $1.1 billion this year on homelessness, 8% of the budget. Again, this does not include the cost of wasted, unusable libraries, danger and garbage on the streets, and tied up emergency services. There is not a single large city that has ever solved its homeless problem, and homeless advocates would have us believe that building more shelters is the answer. Just ask yourself if we build these 60 units, then what? There are thousands of units in San Francisco, and now they're asking for thousands more. It is never enough. Once you start down this path, it is a never-ending cycle of more homelessness, decreased quality of life, and more tax dollars not being spent on schools, maintenance, and police. Today, the San Francisco police force is underfunded and does not have the manpower to stop the rampant car break-ins and theft at their stores. Even big stores such as Walgreens are forced to shut down because it's so bad. Well-intentioned well as it may be, they have made a fatal mistake and we don't have to make the same mistake. There are plenty of cities in the Bay Area that have never had a homeless problem because they focus, on, focus funding on their teachers and police. New York needs help in these areas, so why aren't we helping? If you don't believe me, according to PACE, a group led by faculty from Berkeley and Stanford, California has been spending less than the national average on K-12 education for decades. We have to be the adults in the room. We know that everything has a cost and every dollar we spend on homelessness means one less dollar for our teachers, police, fire, and other services. Since the last city council meeting, I went to talk to some of the residents from Cedar Lane that are located just feet from the project. Many oppose the project and as a city, you cannot claim to speak on their behalf. You did not inform them. You did not ask their opinion. You ignored them. If I can spend my free time after work to talk to the community, then the city whose job is to represent us should too. What if the city did this to your neighborhood without even asking? It is not fair and it is not right. If you want to make a difference and you live at Cedar Lane and anywhere else affected, it is important for you to speak up. This is also a call to action from others in New York. If you don't like what you're hearing, please help. Don't let people tell you that you're wrong and just being fearful. Don't let them put blinders on you. Widen your perspective and see that there are other better uses for these funds. 
Neighbors are already coming to help. A petition is here. Everyone please sign. I know it's not perfect, but we are just volunteers. Even so, we already have 1,500 signatures. If needed, votes are coming. This is an election year for a majority of the city council and we already have 1,500 signatures. If a ragtag team of volunteers can do this over a weekend, imagine what we can accomplish over the next nine months. Finally, it is only hopeless if you give up. If you don't care to speak, then why should anyone else care? Speak now at this meeting. Go out and talk about this issue to just two neighbors and convince them to do the same. To conclude, I urge the city to add this topic onto the agenda for the next meeting to determine a solution that addresses the public's concern. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, next speaker. Vipin Boyan Polly, you have five minutes. Vipin, you have five minutes. I'm sorry, uh, are you able to hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you so much. Uh, Ma'am, I live in the uh, city of New York with my family, and um, we you know, normally take walks in the, in, the, in the evening with my family. I've had this uh, problem of of, uh, of my children getting scared when somebody approaches them on a bicycle um, uh, and, uh, and sometimes just squats uh, on the sidewalk doing stuff that I don't want my children to see. Um, and uh, this is a problem that, that I think will become endemic to New York if we, if we let this uh, proposal of, uh, of, of uh, taking one of our, uh, uh, um, so some of the rooms near New York, uh, um, near the Cedar Boulevard uh, intersection. To, uh, to be reserved for uh, for for the for our homeless, I com I completely oppose that. Uh, it's very near to the New York High School. Children um, do take walks around that block to come to the school. There's a huge uh, community of uh, friends and family that live uh, right around that uh, neighborhood. This is not something that should just be imposed on Pianda and the citizens of New York. This is a new and upcoming city, and the city has really started increasing. Uh, uh, I mean, in the last five years, it's because of opening up uh, residential units. The number of residents have gone up, number of children have grown up. I think we already are a city that is growing very fast, but not enough amenities. I do not see my roads being being uh, um, being maintained properly. Um, I see portions of CW were just being uh, painted, but most of it is not. I see sidewalks are uneven, um, uh, so that when ch children and people are walking, they keep getting hurt all the time. I have hurt my toe. Now I, I make sure that my entire family wears shoes when you even go out for a walk because we keep putting our toes on the sidewalks that are not uh, uh, even. Uh, even. Um, I see that the schools, as, as, as well as they are, the teachers are need, can be better trained. I can see that we need better schools and more schools, even the influx of population at New York. These are the problems that I would like to see my city council solve for me and for the city. Not, star, not for people who are not paying the taxes, not for people who can be better rehabilitated in a, in a, in a, in a different place. Right? I know that there are people who need, these are people who need help and the help can come from them, but not at the cost of my children, not at the cost of my neighbors and friends and family. Um, like like the, the gentleman who spoke before me told me, so I said, uh, there was 1,500 signatures and I'm sure that signatures, it was just 1,500 people that we wanted to collect and this was over the weekend. I know that my entire community here uh, around Timber and Harton and most of, the, most of the people here are very, very opposed to this. They are very concerned and uh, um, we, we, we can... Uh, uh, very well have this mobilized into a place where uh, if, you if you feel that there is more feedback that you would need, uh, we can actually collect that too. Um, I would, th this isn't uh, something that should be imposed on our, in our city, right? I, I, don't, I don't think it's safe. I don't think it's the right thing to do. There are better places to spend my tax dollars as well as my uh, communities. We need to make our city safe. This isn't the right direction, nor is it the right priority. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, next speaker. Greenbelt Alliance, you have five minutes. Hi, uh, sorry, my name wasn't in my email or my uh, my Zoom bio. Uh, my name is Zoe Siegel. I'm the director of climate resilience at Greenbelt Alliance. I will not take the full five minutes. Um, I just wanted to applaud the city's initiative in addressing the, our homeless crisis. And think I think the narrative of you know, I support homeless, just not near me really needs to end. Um, as a result of the pandemic, there are many people who have fallen on hard times. And I think we really need to, you know, as a 
as a region, as a county, as a, as a city of Newark, need to have compassion towards them. Um, not building a homeless shelter doesn't mean the homeless will just disappear. They just won't have the services that they need. Um, and while I fully support increased funding for education, I do not believe there's a correlation between cities who direct funding towards education and those who don't have a homeless problem. Um, I think the first speaker is right in saying that there really is never enough, um, but there is a, this is a really great step in the right direction. Okay, thank you very much. Next speaker, please. We, okay, here we go. Oli, you have five minutes. Hello, good evening, everyone. My name is Oli. I just want to know that can city share a specific plan? How do we help homeless other than provide them shelter? For example, what are the qualification criteria you accept the people being moved into that residence building? Are we providing them job training skills if they're able? Are we give them, um, let's say for example, mental illness help if they have a mental illness? Just by providing a shelter doesn't solve the fundamental problems. So I would be more concerned that just simply provide them shelter without a specific effective plan. So where are these plans and when can they be shared with public? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Vishal, you have five minutes. Uh, hi. So uh, we do not approve the homeless shelter as it is really close to the mall, Challenger School, Newark High School, daycares, upscale restaurants, retail shops, etc. We see potential crimes like child ab abduction, drug selling, theft, and whatnot. We have spent our hard-earned money to buy houses here, and we wish the city should give priority to the current residents. We feel we are more vulnerable than the people who are not even here. Our fear should not be ignored. And if people who are having uh, affording uh, problems, then they should move to the other cities. Like, we are not buying houses in Cupertino because we cannot afford it there. So if people cannot afford to stay in Newark, they should move to other parts of the Bay Area. That's, that's what we feel, we, but our tax money should be more spent on providing security to us and to our kids. Our kids do not deserve to live around the homeless and get scared. They are the future of Newark and that should be taken into consideration. We have bought these homes after doing a lot of research. And now if uh, the city comes up with such plans, it's like, uh, it's, it's really scary for us because we are having all million dollar homes here and we will be the first one to be targeted as we are the, uh, newer homes, so any kind of theft or any kind of uh, crimes will be for uh, first targeted to us. So we want to be given preference. We are the vulnerable right right now. So please take care of us and our kids. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Mona R, you have five minutes. Hey. I hope you guys can hear me. Um, so I, I just want to, I don't, I'm not going to do the full five minutes and I don't have a long uh, speech prepared either. Uh, I just want to say I, I completely support the shelter that you guys are building um, and the effort. Um, and just commensurating with some of the neighbors, I'm again, I'm a city member of, uh, resident of New York. Um, and I've lived in the Bay Area for my entire life. My husband's been, we're, we're both born and raised here. Um, we've lived in San Francisco for 10 years. I just wanna you know, uh, say again, this is not San Francisco. Uh, so we shouldn't be comparing ourselves or our homeless issue with San Francisco. Um, I myself have never felt threatened um, in the city of Newark. I go around, I live my day. I work from home, um, I, I visit the mall. Uh, my daughter, you know, she's five, she goes to school here. We've never encountered any homeless issues or any mentally sick folks, um, and not that that matters. Like it just, there are neighbors too, and I think there's been a lot of rhetoric around. Um, frankly, it's been hateful um, that's been spread around uh, in order to create fear where there is shouldn't be. Um, and there's kind of neighborly thing. Well, where you know our neighbors should unite. There are neighbors too, and we need to be very respectful of that. I understand there's a lot of different opinions out there, and that's 
completely okay for people to be opposed and, 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 you know, that's fine, but I think it should be based on the right thing. And the right thing that's being circulated right now is not fact-based. It is a fact that homeless shelters and these type of communes actually provide support to these folks, get people like this off of the street, you know, and provide support and uh, social support where it's needed. Um, it, that's a proven fact. There have been various studies done uh, that confirm that. So if anything, I feel safer with this thing being built, with this being, being with project being supported. Um, that's just basically what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Jay, you have five minutes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, so uh, I just want to let you know that I oppose city's plan to build the homeless shelter next to five schools. And I would also question uh, what criteria did they use to finalize this location and why they didn't inform nearby communities. I, just, I live next door to the uh, uh, Marriott Hotel and we were not informed, not even my neighbors, why this agenda was kept hidden un until the last minute before the vote. And I also heard people uh, stating that people lost job due to uh, pandemic, but there are local shops who are in need of employees who are not able to find employees such as UPS, FedEx, Foodmax, Walmart, Costco, a lot of local restaurants. They're, they are not able to find employees. And here we are we are using that justification as that people have lost the job, they don't have job. And so we have to uh, uh, build the homeless shelter. Um, that, that, that just not justify what criteria have been used. What criteria are you using to justify that, that people lost the jobs and don't have job right now? That's not, that's not uh, you know, justified and uh, city needs to look at this thoroughly. Again, this is not the place to build homeless shelter and I oppose this. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, next speaker. Nadia, you have five minutes. Uh, hello, uh, everyone. I completely oppose building a shelter next to the high school. Um, uh, I also would like to know what is your answer to all the question. We are like more than 90% are opposite of building the shelter. What is your response? Last meeting as well, like I think 99% were oppose, opposing it and you guys went ahead with the proposal what is uh, like we are just uh, speaking here and you guys already have made up your mind uh, please uh, give us some answer are you considering our whatever we are presenting you here thank you thank you uh, city clerk carrington uh, how many more speakers is there sir right now we have three hands raised However, we do have 51 attendees. Okay. So what I would like to suggest to the people who haven't spoken yet, and they would like to speak, and we certainly want to hear their input, but we would like to hear uh, new input and not a rehashing of what other people have said before. So if you have something new, uh, we would certainly uh, uh, relish hearing that but please uh, refrain from making comments about what we've already heard several times in the past. Okay, so thank you. So next speaker, please. Okay. Neha, you have five minutes. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi, uh, so I, again, I completely oppose the homeless shelter, which is getting built in uh, the New York City. Uh, it's very close to the high school daycare. And there is a lot of, you know, people, small kids going around. I really don't like this idea of building a homeless shelter. I know if the city wants to make the city better, there are many other things that the city can do. Schools are not good. Why not spend that money there? If you want to provide shelter, please, you can create some place away from these places and build shelter. 
why in middle of the city the cedar boulevard is like a main road where all the people can come go out why in the main city you have to think about this we want to make this city better we don't want drugs to come in we don't want uh, violence to come in you have to think about these factors i don't know what the criteria you have decided and went with this there are homes there are children all of them are around why you want to increase the chances of you know having all these robberies thefts drugs and make this a bad place please think about it this one change which you will do will impact several lives it will create a bad impact for the city we have to build a city make it better please think about it and yeah that's it from my side uh, okay. thank you so much okay thank you sir uh, next speaker please ray you have 5 minutes oh uh, sorry can you hear me yes, yes. sir all right, cool. Um, so here's my perspective. Um, I think I'm in support that you know those people and those neighbors who lost their jobs needs help. But I think you know I also saw the news. Fremont is also trying to apply the fund. You know the same 39 million home key project. Just in my opinion, for you know who live in the Bay Areas for over 15 years. I think you know Newark should withdraw their application and then have Fremont to take that grant because just simply you know Fremont has way more better infrastructures to support that. Um, in terms of hospitals, currently today Newark has no hospitals. Everyone I know that we need to go to Washington these Washington hospitals. There's the you know Sutter Health. They have way more better you know health supporting systems than Newark does. And then second, you know, this is all because I think Newark has a growing population and then there's not enough infrastructure to even meet the increasing demand for the existing residents. There's really, you know, and especially for those folks who needs actual support, I just feel like Fremont is a better choice. And also there's like Central Park, Lake Elizabeth, you know, where folks can get exercise. Like if you look at Newark today, right? We don't even have a big park. Like, like all these residents go to Fremont to take a walk and then, you know, walk, walk for themselves, walk their dogs. And then also from, you know, I think the end goal is to help them to back to the society, get a job, get a permanent housing. And Fremont just has way more opportunities in there. There's, you know, way more small business, local restaurant, they, they have Tesla there. But looking at Newark, right? Like, I don't think we're in a better position to support this when there's a way better competitors to help those folks out. So here's my position. Um, thanks, that's it. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, next speaker, please. Stephanie, you have five minutes. Hi, um, so this will be a little bit different from what you've probably been hearing. I'm actually in support of the project. Um, I'm a relatively new Newark resident and um, I actually think that it's a great idea. Um, and I, I worry that um, a lot of these, a lot of these uh, people are saying, you know, like that, that the majority of us oppose it, but I don't think that's necessarily true. That it could, it could be a vocal minority so I just urge everyone here to really take into account what actually you know about what, what our city needs um, and how we can help more of our residents um, instead of listening to you know, the people who are able to join these meetings and to voice their opinions. Um, I, I think that actually homelessness is a big problem um, and it's not just for big cities to help solve. I think that small cities should also help um, and we should do our part to try to help. It's, we can't ignore that this is a problem and it's leaking into our cities also, uh, our small cities. It's not just a problem in San Francisco or Oakland anymore. Um, and, and it's kind of like, I, I don't think we should look away from that. 
So I really do appreciate um, that you all are moving forward with this project and I urge you to continue moving forward um, with this project and that you should know that there are residents in our city who do support it and who really do believe that it is something good and that will benefit the majority of our residents. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Justin, you have five minutes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hi, um, I would like to say that I oppose this plan as well. And I understand where it's coming from um, to help the homeless, they definitely need shelter. But uh, from my experience living next door to this uh, resident's uh, town place uh, suits, we actually share a fence with this uh, hotel. And from what I've been seeing, and this is the, what's really concerning me the most, the week, Weekend after this proposal was approved, we had an unsheltered individual across the street from us. He pulled his pants down a few times. He chased after a kid. Then he jumped in front of a few cars. Then he flipped off a few uh, individuals. Then, then he put a lot of trash on the street, right? So the concern that I have, right, is that after that, I called the police because he's definitely disrupting the peace. But then all they can say to me was that, they cannot do anything because I'm a third person. The person who's actually feeling victimized is the one that can call until they do something. So because of that, I already feel a sense of loss security. And then having this um, shelter in place in an area that has a high density of residents, that only concerns that there's gonna be more individuals like this. And it only takes a few, even though a lot of people want to improve their lives to uh, make us not feel safe. So that's my biggest concern. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Uh, next speaker, please. Ronick, you have five minutes. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, so I oppose this opposite, uh, you know, the proposal for, you know, the homeless shelter for, a uh, couple of reasons. One of the first uh, reason is the location. Uh, the location is because I've lived in Cedar Lane community, very very close to the hotel, and there were few few very uh, several incidents, like including today that you know the homeless guys, you know, usually bang the door, and when we call the police, uh, you know, screaming around outside, and like you know when we call the police, police like don't do anything, even though they invade the pri privacy of a lot of time, right? So building a shelter right nearby it will you know invite a lot of other homeless people like you know to you know uh, uh, do this kind of stuff so i definitely oppose uh, my neighbors uh, are not not feeling safe like you know especially going around this situation so definitely i would you know i'm opposing this uh, proposal you know in a, and the second thing is you know i have asked this question to the newark council city council in the past as well but i never got a clear answer that why Newark, like in Newark, in last five years, six years, there were so many new housing were built, right? Why Newark Council has not even considered for, you know, reserving like at least some percentage of housing for the low income or homeless, uh, you know, people? Why that case is not even considered when rather than making a forceful decision on, you know, building the shelter? So I propose instead of building a shelter like this, Having a like you know unplanned, I would propose like you know we have a lot of new communities coming up, right? A lot of new housing coming up. Why Newark City Council is not considering you know reserves some percentage of housing for low-income people or homeless people? Wouldn't that be a good plan, proposed plan, so that way people are aware of it and the builders are aware of it, right? That what they need to do. I mean that would be a good proposal, good good idea for the for the people like you know low income housing because they can afford a new housing in a good environment good community so i definitely encourage you know city council to look in this proposal and i are definitely oppose because it's it is in like you know close to where like a lot of daycares a lot of restaurant owner residents community members i mean it will impact a lot so i urge i, I oppose this opposition thank you thank you sir uh next speaker please Dowd, you have five minutes. Do 
Daoud, D-A-O-U-D, you have five minutes. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm a resident of Newark, and I do not approve this project. Please speak um, up, Daoud. Yeah. Can you hear me? Barely. Uh, give me one second. Sir, are you still there? Yeah, can you hear me? You're Sorry. very faint. You're very difficult to hear. I'll tell you what, Dal, why don't you get, try to get your uh, technical problems straightened out? In the meantime, we'll go to the next speaker and we'll come back to you. Okay, next speaker, please. Okay. Anant, you have five minutes. Anant, please begin. Anant, do you hear us? Maybe go to the next speaker and come back. Rajesh, you have five minutes. Hi, uh, this is Rajesh, and uh, thanks for the opportunity uh, for talking here uh, on this uh, forum. Uh, so, yeah, I strongly oppose to this project, and uh, uh, I I pretty much uh, uh, in line with uh, uh, whatever that has been told before um, by the people who oppose the project. Uh, um, the um, the two things uh, that stays in my mind is uh, uh, the first thing is about the notification when uh, you know when this was uh, uh, <clears throat> when this was told to us uh, we hardly we barely had like uh, six hours or so and uh, um, honestly I don't think that's the right way to do about it because uh, 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 because I'm just next door and uh, uh, this place is just uh, you know one minute walk away from my place so um, uh, you know a better notification would you know, should have been done by the city, uh, considering that, um, you know, um, uh, I've been regular in paying, I mean, like all, like all fellow residents, uh, I've been regular in paying my, you know, property taxes every time, and uh, I expect the same kind of service back. Um, the second part is, uh, I still don't understand what is the plan that the city is going to do. So we have all the, uh, you know, uh, we have this homeless people come. Uh, so what is the, so what is the budget uh, that is being allocated for this? And how long uh, would they be, you know, uh, would uh, would the city be um, budgeting this for? And what happens after that? So um, maybe for the two years, three years, and what's going to happen after that? Uh, uh, is the city is going to give more funding for that? And uh, and and I don't, I, I, I still don't have a clear picture as to how uh, this project is going to resolve the homelessness, because ultimately the objective is to resolve the homelessness, and uh, uh, there is no clear cut plan on this, and. Uh, it would be good if uh, uh, this can be shared. This information can, you know, can be shared on a wider scale uh, as to how, uh, you know, you're going to resolve it. And uh, again, I'm not going to uh, tell the same thing about the security and safety issue because that's already been talked over. Uh, but yeah, but I agree the same points uh, that has been addressed so far. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Rajesh, are you the same one who just spoke or is this a different Rajesh with the hand up? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, yeah, it's the same person. Uh, so I just spoke before and um, 
Uh, I have already muted it, but I don't know. I still keep getting notification to unmute myself. Oh, okay, sir. That's okay. I'll mute, mute you. Can you hear me this time? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so my name is Anant Rishi. I live here in Newark. Um, I actually support the project. I think given the economic situations, the flow and increase of homeless is only going to speed up. Um, I think we're at the largest point in time where we have a large working homeless uh, population. The wages are not keeping up with those individuals to keep up and pay rent. Um, I think a hand off, a few one-off run-ins with the homeless people that are mentally ill, obviously, if they're exposing themselves, should not be counted against the rest of the people that actually really do need the help and are working and want to maintain decent lives in the city of Newark and not want to be displaced. So I think that would go a long way. And another thing is, if we don't manage it soon, it will balloon into a problem that becomes unmanageable. These people aren't going to disappear. They're just not going to go somewhere else. They're going to continue working their jobs, living in their cars, living in their RVs, and it will just become more expensive to handle at a later time. If we can set up an area for these people to get help, assistant, transition points, it would just be better for the city of New York because I know a lot of people have brought up this comment about, oh, I paid a million dollars for the home, yada, yada, yada. Well, this ballooning is not going to help you <laughs> if that's a concern, but that shouldn't be a concern. Helping your fellow citizens should be your concern. Having empathy for those individuals should be your concern. And that's how we should move forward. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, next speaker, please. Ashley, you have five minutes. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Ashley Mo. I strongly oppose converting the hotel to the homeless shelter. I truly understand that homeless is a real problem. You know, it's, it's happening everywhere by giving them a shelter so then they can be off the street. I totally get it. My main question is that I'm not sure if this is the right location. Um, aside from many points that other residents have raised, um, one thing I want to ask you is, that have you thought about if the residents violated the rule if they get evicted, where are they gonna be? They are gonna be on the street, right? If the homeless hear that there's a shelter right here, where are they gonna go? They're gonna go near that area. So my concern is that what that area is gonna be if we have that shelter there, right? We have a lot of children there, a lot of residents there. It's a thriving community. Um, so I urge you to reconsider this location again. I support this program. It's just, I'm not sure if this is the right location. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Raza, you have five minutes. Hello guys. Yeah, uh, my name is Raza Jaffrey. I'm a resident of Newark and I am opposed to this project of uh, mainly because of the location. And I am, I just feel like we are just uh, have a reassuring short-sightedness by saying, okay, we're gonna get the $39 million and we'll develop the property and then what? Like other people have uh, raised the concern before, what is the plan going forward? How are we going to support uh, all these homeless people? living in Newark. And so, I mean, I just don't understand the cause of homelessness is not because they don't have a job. Most of the homeless, a lot of the homeless people are mentally ill and what are we doing to support them? Yes, I am completely for helping uh, fellow citizens and I'm all about helping people, but I just don't think homeless people are homeless because they don't have homes. Some of them, yes, but are we, do we really know? Have we done the homework to divide them into different categories? What is the process that we're gonna follow? How many people, like, let's say there are, like, we have like 50% of the uh, occupation, uh, the, the, the residences will be given to homeless people. And like, what kind of homeless people are we talking about? Are we talking about, like one of the council members in the last meeting said there were two, uh, 
um, servers who lost their job. They were both uh, a couple with kids. So yes, I'm all for that, sure. But like maybe we can have some process in, uh, in place where it show us the last year's tax returns and maybe then you're, you're homeless, you're still trying to get back on your feet. Sure, we can help you. But what about the chronically homeless people who are just mentally unstable? They need mental help. They don't need homes. And even if you provide them homes, who's going to take care of them in the facility? Like, you know, what are you going to have there? Are you going to have medical staff? Um, so it's just like, I, I just don't understand. Uh, this has been thought, um, thought out. Uh, I, I don't mean to dis, um, um, to disrespect anybody here, but I just, um, we didn't see the communication. So I just assume, I'm just assuming that it's being rushed through. So uh, that's, that's, it. that's basically it for me. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, next speaker, please. Akav Verma, you have five minutes. Yeah, hi, uh, this is Akash. Uh, I won't uh, take all, uh, uh, all of the full five minutes, but and uh, so I definitely, I, I, I oppose this homelessness shelter proposal. And then I don't want to like touch on some of the security concerns that some of the residents have already touched upon. And uh, I agree, I mean, there needs to be like this problem of homelessness needs to be addressed, but not at the cost of the current residents and people. And uh, the, the people mentioned that uh, we, as, we as being good neighbors uh, need to take care of uh, the, the, the people who need support. But uh, we also need to uh, ensure that the people staying by that, uh, by the near uh, the, the location, they also have uh, security issues and they also been respected and they, they, they are also our neighbors as well. And uh, one common thing is uh, everyone is like comparing neighborhood with San Francisco and Oakland, right? So my, my concern is why do we want to convert Newark to a next next San Francisco in Oakland. I mean, and uh, my, my 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 opposition is primarily because of the location, uh, because it's close to the grocery shops and schools and uh, whatnot. And then uh, one question is, uh, when is city going to address some of the concerns that were raised by the residents? And uh, what are the next steps uh, on this one? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, please. Dowd, you have five minutes. Hi, can you hear me? You're a little faint. Is it better now? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I do not approve this uh, project. Instead, um, uh, instead of having a homeless shelter, it will be better if it's a uh, hundred percent a low income uh, shelter. Uh, the reason is um, you the people that has a that are approving this project, have you asked yourself why there are people that are homeless? Uh, obviously, it's not about jobs. It uh, has to be with mental illness. So instead of helping out uh, the homeless people, helping with uh, get them some help with the mental illness. Um, right now, the, uh, I'm, I'm sure you guys shop around. You guys go to UPS, Foodmax, Safeway. They're, they're short of people. You have to wait in line almost extra time because they're saying we don't have people that want to work. Um, so, you know, there's jobs out there if people really want to work. Um, so low income, if there are people that are working, but they, they're not making enough, that would be much better for this community. You can have more people come here and help out work in Safeway, work in 7-Eleven. Um, you know, you want people, hard working people, but um, for homeless people, homes are not the issue. It's mental illness. If you guys really want to help these people, get them help like this. Get them ready. Get some. Uh, get them some education, and then they can go work and get a job out there. I mean, it's. Uh, I mean, you guys see it everywhere you go. There's a line, is or instead of this money, give it to the police department. And, uh, you know, they need help also. They're short. If you call them for any help, you know, if it, unless if there's not a, a gun involved or knife, they won't show up. Uh, you know, they'll say you gotta wait one hour. We're busy. You know, why not give that money to the police department? Um, so that's why I would approve a, just a low income uh, property for people that work. And, uh, you know, just like other cities like Fremont, they have low income properties. There's people that are working in that community. Um, you know, it helps the community like this, uh, but doesn't make sense right now to bring a homeless shelter here 
bring crime in here. You know, I'm sure all the homeless people, they're not bad people. They're good people, but they need help with mental illness. You know, this is the, the issue here. Okay, you, if you guys really care and you, you know, you guys want to help the homeless people, this is the way to help. Not just put them in the uh, homes here, uh, you know, cause crime, cause other, even normal people to have, uh, you know, other issues. Uh, you're going to have people leaving out this uh, city. Uh, um, so at this time, you know, the market, you, you see how jobs are. They're, everywhere you go, they're high right now. You go to McDonald's, uh, they're closing early because there's no one to work there. Um, so, you know, it's not that um, you're just making people more lazy, you know, just stay home and live in, in a homeless shelter. No, give them help to, you know, help, help them get a job. You know, so um, this is uh, uh, what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, next speaker, please. Your Honor, that appears to conclude public comment. Okay. Uh, before we go to the, the uh, consent calendar, I want to make a few comments. I'm sorry, Your Honor, one more hand just raised after I said that. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, hello, I'm so sorry. Um, I was about to raise just before you concluded the public comments, but thank you for giving me the opportunity. Um, I just wanna echo what all my fellow residents uh, already mentioned. Now, by the way, I'm Smriti and I've been in New York since 2014. Um, I just want to uh, point out that uh, we are in a residential area uh, and this proposal is going to really affect the um, children more than anything. Um, uh, we have enough examples uh, that my <clears throat> fellow residents already spoke about uh, with regard to uh, the hazards created by um, homeless people around. Um, disregarding the uh, home prices, I still feel the security and safety of the residents definitely need to be considered. Um, the only question that um, I, I think many people also raised, but I've still not heard an answer for is, um, are there any other places considered for this um, facility to be, uh, uh, for this project to be um, built upon? Um, if not, uh, why or how was this location kind of narrowed down upon? Um, and uh, like, yeah, and the other uh, point that my husband also is just uh, asking me or like pointing me to is that what happens if the once the funding stops to the project? Uh, we all understand the initial funding is um, if at all gets approved, then it can be enough to sustain for a while. We don't know how long, but provided that uh, that it may be for a year or two, but after that, we will definitely need funding um, to sustain this project. So we would definitely love to hear the answers for these questions. Um, and thank you for giving me the opportunity. Okay, thank you. We do have one more, Your Honor. Okay. Next speaker. Karen, you have five minutes. Uh, thank you, and hopefully I don't need all five minutes. Um, so um, what I wanted to say first and foremost is that I'm, I'm proud of the city of Newark for taking on a project like Project Home Keys. Um, I really want to see more of this, and I've, I've written to, uh, I think, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and all of you council members in, in uh, expressing my op uh, opinion here. Uh, we live, um, I'm living uh, in Sanctuary Village, which is a new community here, and we do live a life of great privilege and wealth here um, with some of our home prices now going over $2 million. And I understand that some of my neighbors are concerned about their home prices and also have concerns about uh, safety, um, which I think are fair and th those are the concerns of our neighbors. However, they do not outweigh such an important project as Project Home Keys. Th uh, those who are in need deserve uh, what we are doing here for them. And I do wish uh, and I do hope that uh, you all will be able to address some of the concerns of my neighbors by educating us and sharing with us the right information uh, so that we don't have this paranoia that suddenly this project will lead to, you know, crime-ridden infestation in our great city. Um, and even though we are a small city, I'm, I'm proud that we are taking these steps uh, towards helping those who need help instead of uh, just lip service. That is all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 
Uh, next, next speaker. That concludes public comment, Your Honor. Okay. So again, before I turn it over to uh, City Manager uh, Benoon, I would like to uh, let people know that uh, this is a public comment time. And this is a time when the public can comment to the council. It's not a time for debate uh, with the council as far as uh, the council responding to the public comment. As a matter of fact, we are precluded from doing that because of Brown Act uh, issues. And uh, so with that, I'd like to uh, uh, turn it over to uh, City Manager Benoon. But and in doing that, uh, perhaps you could touch on what the uh, how people were informed of this uh, potential project. And then I, I know at the last meeting, there was some talk about some follow-up uh, information that would be given to people as well. So please, uh, City Manager Benoon, enlighten us. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. And if I may just go back a moment, just wanted to underscore the mayor's comments in regards to the Brown Act. Now, the Brown Act is state law that um, governs local agencies and regulates how those agencies uh, conduct themselves. And uh, those laws make it very clear uh, that items uh, that are not on the agenda cannot be discussed and deliberated by the council. And so uh, the council is not free to make any comments or make any deliberations in regards to this project this evening. And so I would suggest that the council members refrain from making any comments at this point in time. Um, in regards to the specifics on this project, um, the staff did uh, work with the developer on this project to host a community meeting. And that community meeting was held on November 10th. Um, all property owners within a 500 foot radius of the subject property were sent a written notice of the meeting and the meeting was held via Zoom. Uh, the responses we received were positive uh, from the speaker to that that appeared. Uh, following that meeting, we held our council meeting uh, back on January 13th uh, to discuss this matter. We received a considerable amount of public input uh, in regards to this project. And here we are two weeks later, continuing to receive a fair amount of public comment on this item, despite the fact that it's not on the agenda. I think as a result of that, staff is inclined to uh, consider some further engagement with our residents. And uh, we're discussing that. Uh, at the staff level, and we'll have more information soon. Uh, this item will be scheduled for public consideration uh, back on the city council agenda at a future time to discuss the monetary impacts in an affordable housing agreement. And we'll be discussing it at that point in time. Uh, but between now and then, uh, the city staff will work with our residents uh, and provide some further details on the project. I think it's fairly clear, fairly clear to say Based off the input we received two weeks ago and tonight, uh, there's a considerable amount of, of misunderstandings and, and misperceptions of the project. And staff will certainly work with our residents uh, to clarify those misunderstandings. Uh, this is a um, bona fide service provider. They're a 501c3 organization. It's not a homeless shelter per se. We come in and offer affordable housing uh, for those who are at risk and those who are currently experiencing homelessness. That organization uh, will be more than happy to work with us and work with our residents to explain the nature of the project, their screening processes, so on and so forth. Uh, in those engagements, staff will explain the nature of the funds, how the funds that are being committed to this project are, um, are, are limited. Uh, they are not discretionary, um, they're restricted funds. Um, so with that, I am probably said uh, enough, uh, as much as I can possibly say at this point, uh, considering this item is not on the agenda. Uh, Mr. Turner, I don't know if you have anything you'd like to briefly add uh, to my brief kind of summary that I gave. Uh, I don't, thank you. All right. So with that, uh, Your Honor, staff will consider uh, various engagement options and we will uh, work with our residents in the ensuing months uh, before this item comes back to the council for the affordable housing agreement. Okay, thank you, city manager. Okay, with that, the next item on the agenda is the consent calendar. Consent calendar consists of items D1 through D7. Uh, first, are there any items that staff would like pulled from the consent calendar? Not this evening, Your Honor. Okay. Are there any items that the public would like pulled from the consent calendar or public comment? 
There are none, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Are there any items that the council would like pulled from the consent calendar? Not tonight, Your Honor. No, Mayor. Okay. So the consent calendar is going to consist of the following items. Uh, D.1 is approval of audited demands. D.2 is approval of the January 6, uh, 2022 and January 13, 2022 minutes. Item D3 is adopt a resolution confirming the continued existence of a local emergency due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Item D4 is adopt a resolution finding that there is a proclaimed state of emergency, finding that the meeting in person would present imminent risk to the health or safety of attendees as a result of the state of emergency and authorizing continued remote teleconference meetings of the legislative bodies of the city of Newark for the 30 day period beginning January 27th, pursuant to AB 361. Item D5 is adopt a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute a contractual services agreement with Environmental Services Inc. and authorizing amendment of the 2020-2022 biennial budget for fiscal year 2022 to provide funding for general plan updates and related services associated with the 2023-2031 housing element. Item D6 is approval of the resolution to add class, class specifications for police support services manager, aquatic activity specialist, and accounting technician one, two, to the classification plan. Add full-time personnel allocations to the 2020-2022 biennial budget and capital improvement plan for one police support services manager, one aquatics activity specialist, and one accounting technician 1-2, and delete one communication supervisor and one accounting technician 1. Approve a side letter with the Newark Police Management Association to add the classification of police support services manager and salary range to the memorandum of understanding and approve a side letter with the Newark Association of Miscellaneous Employees to add the classification of aquatic activity specialist and salary range to the memorandum of understanding. And item D7 is approval of a resolution to add full-time personnel allocations to the 2020-2022 biennial budget and capital improvement plan for one crime analyst, one additional information systems technician, and one additional general laborer. Add a class specification to the classification plan for a crime analyst and approve a side letter with the Newark Police Management Association to add the classification of crime analyst and assign salary ranges to the memorandum of understanding. Would someone like to move items be approved as recommended by staff with any items approved by resolution or ordinance being numbered consecutively and that the reading of the titles suffice for introduction or adoption of the ordinance? So moved. Second. Okay. Okay, moved by Council Member Bucci, seconded by Council Member Quayazo. Uh, roll call, please, uh, City Clerk Harrington. Council Members Bucci. Oh, sorry, aye. Quayazo. Aye. Freitas. Yes. Vice Mayor Hannon. Aye. Mayor Nagy. Aye. Motion passes five ayes. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, item E is uh, public hearings and uh, E1 uh, staff report, uh, Mr. Benoon. Yes, good evening again, Your Honor and members of the council. Uh, item E1 is a public hearing to consider a developer's request to annex their properties uh, into tract 8453, um, excuse me, into landscaping and lighting district number 19. Uh, tonight, our senior civil engineer, Ms. Diana Kenko, will provide us with the staff report. Ms. Kenko. Thank you, Mr. Benoon. Uh, good evening, Your Honor and members of the council. Track 8453, known as Harbor Point, is a 192 single family residential development by Lennar Homes of California Incorporated, located in Bayside, Newark. <clears throat> Excuse me. Harbor Point is located on Enterprise Drive, west of Hickory Street. On December 9th, 2021, City Council initiated proceedings for the annexation of Track 8453 to Zone 7, Harbor Point of Landscaping and Lighting District number 19. Council approve 
the preliminary engineer's report, and council directed ballots to be mailed to all affected property owners. Notice of tonight's public hearing and a ballot was mailed to the property owner of all parcels of track 8453, notifying and allowing the property owner to vote on the proposed annexation. Council may now open the public hearing for the annexation of track 8453 to zone seven, Harbor Point of Landscaping Lighting District number 19. After the close of the public hearing, council may then direct the city clerk to tabulate the ballots and announce the results. If a majority protest does not exist, council may consider approving the annexation. Um, this concludes staff's presentation. I'd be happy to answer questions if you have any at this time. Okay, thank you. Uh, does the council have any questions of staff before I open the public hearing? I have a, a question, um, Your Honor. Yes, Council Member Coyazo. Okay, on um, one of the pages here, I believe it's 126, it says um, traffic circles. Those are the roundabouts. And That's the roundabout, ever since they were brought up that they were going to be put in, I had speci specifically said that these roundabouts needed to be beautiful. And from what I've seen, they're not looking very beautiful. So I, I want to know what, what our next process is for those roundabouts. Um, there are several roundabouts that are uh, currently in place at Bayside. One that we have discussed in the past specifically was the one at Enterprise and Willow. Um, if you have uh, recently noticed, um, there's some changes that have happened. Um, I think when we talked about it, there was a new water line that was coming in, a sewer tie-in to the center of the roundabout. And so those construction have further uh, 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 damaged the existing roundabout. Since that discussion um, and the completion of those utility installations, uh, you may have noticed that Taylor Morrison, which is the uh, developer that's responsible for those maintenance of the roundabouts at this time, um, have uh, recently decreased the landscaping area, which allows for additional asphalt to allow trucks that are making that left turn um, to have additional uh, hardscape to um, travel on. We wanted to make sure that the decrease and the changes that are happening um, are the changes that um, aren't gonna produce additional damages. And so the developer agreed to try it out with what we called an asphalt berm. These were interim. Um, the asphalt berm allows us to see damages so that when we do put in the permanent fix, we know that those uh, replacement are going to be further damaged afterwards. So about two weeks ago, we met with uh, Taylor Morrison. We looked at the, um, the asphalt berm and we noticed that they're um, still intact. And, and we think that this alignment or change modification will be uh, one that would not get further damage. So um, they are hoping to mobilize and do the permanent fix um, within the next month. So um, there will be some changes happening. Okay, I will be driving by. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mayor, may I make a comment? Uh, Vice Mayor Hannon. Yes, uh, thank you for the report. I have an opportunity to walk down there frequently and I did notice that the, uh, the roundabout has been widened a little bit to allow, I think, easier vehicle access through the roundabout. Uh, is there a suggested speed limit for folks going through the roundabout? Because it does appear to me that some vehicles go through that roundabout rather fast. Is there a suggested speed limit? And do we anticipate posting any kind of a suggested speed for folks that do use the roundabout? So prior to the Bayside development coming in, the speed limits on Willow were, I believe, 40 and 45 miles per hour. We have since done a speed survey and um, the posted speed limit at this time is 35 miles per hour. Um, the specific plan identified this area as one that would be um, posted at 25 miles per hour, but obviously we cannot um, just change it without doing speed surveys um, and taking the 85th percentile. So uh, we hope that um, through, the, um, through the roundabouts and additional 
um, um, uh, reduction, addition of landscaping, it further reduces the speeds that uh, vehicles are um, traveling in through that area. Um, and I believe we are also contemplating um, reassigning or relocating the truck routes that may help with the situation out there too. Thank you. And my last comment was as you uh, then cross over uh, just past the roundabout in the crosswalk, uh, visibility sometimes for pedestrians can be somewhat of a challenge for cars that are kind of speeding through the roundabout. So just want to suggest as we look at that area and that area for improvement later on that we consider maybe lowering some of the landscaping so that visibility of pedestrians uh, doesn't become a, uh, an issue for the drivers. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Uh, any further comments before we open the public hearing? Okay, if not, the public hearing is now open. Uh, City Clerk Harrington, do we have any comments from the public? We do not, Your Honor. Okay, then I'll close the public hearing and uh, City Clerk Harrington, can you please open and tabulate the ballot? Right. The ballot is in favor of uh, forming the assessment. Okay. So does the council have any comments on that? No comments? And then is there a motion to adopt the resolution in a second? So moved, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Council Member Coyote second, moves. Second the motion. Council Member Freitas seconds. Uh, roll call vote, please. Council Members Bucci? Aye. Coyazo? Aye. Freitas? Yes. Vice Mayor Hannon? Aye. Mayor Nagy? Aye. Motion passes five ayes. Resolution of the City Council of the City of New York approving the final engineer's report and approving the annexation of Tract 8453 to Zone 7 Harbor Point of Landscaping and Lighting District Number 19. Okay. Okay, thank you. So item F is other business and there's uh, no items under item F tonight. We'll go to item G, city council matters. And the first item is a uh, appointment to fill a vacancy on the planning commission. And uh, Karen Bridges has resigned from the planning commission in November. Her term was scheduled to expire on December 31 of 2024. Applications to fill the vacancy were, see were received from Mark Gonzalez, Lori Bogusic, Namit Saxena, Raju Matthew, Matthew Jorgens, and Jason Miguel. And tonight I'm recommending the appointment of uh, Lori Bogusic to the Planning Commission. Let me just say that uh, uh, the six candidates that uh, were applicants that applied uh, were just uh, uh, outstanding candidates. And uh, you know, Newark would be well served by, by any of the candidates, but uh, you know, there's a lot of decisions go into making an appointment like this. And uh, I'm recommending Lori. You know, she has uh, is a long-term Newark resident. She's currently serving on the Community Development Advisory Council, and she teaches preschool. And uh, she also volunteers for her church. So, uh, I'm looking for uh, Lori to join the the uh, Planning Commission with the approval of the City Council. Uh, do you City need a motion Clerk for Aaron, that? Um, uh, before we do, I'd ask City Clerk Carrington if we have any public comment. We do not, Your Honor. Okay, council comments? Uh, real quick, Mr. Mayor. Yes. You know, just that I recognize a lot of those names and you're right, there's a lot of deserving folks who threw their name in the hat this time. <coughs> and, uh, it's pretty lucky for us to have so many good folks to choose from. So uh, I certainly would want to encourage them to uh, apply in the future. And um, we have other advisory committees and things that we can always use some good help on. So uh, I would definitely encourage those folks to apply again. So, and, and want to thank them for doing so. Okay. Excellent comments, uh, Council Member Bucci. And uh, I will say this is, this is, was pretty tough, but uh, if this is any indication of the type of uh, applications we get in the future, Newark will well be served. So, uh, uh, so with that, I'd ask for a motion. 
Mayor, I'll, I'll make that motion that we support your recommendation for the Planning Commission. Okay, and is there a second to that? Second. Council, okay, so uh, Vice Mayor Hannon uh, moves and Council Member Bucci seconds. Uh, roll call vote, please. Council Members Bucci. Aye. Coyazo. Aye. Freitas. Aye. Vice Mayor Hannon. Aye. Mayor Nagy. Aye. Motion passes five ayes. Okay. Thank you. Resolution of the City Council of the City of Newark approving the appointment of Lori Bovisic to the Planning Commission. Okay. Okay, so uh, furthermore, under, under council comments, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, Susie made the, the fatal mistake of bringing up the roundabouts. So, uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask about the roundabout that's on, uh, or proposed anyway, for Central Avenue, at Willow. And I know that uh, that's supposed to be uh, put in at some point, but uh, you know, it's been several years since that development's been completed and there's still no roundabout there. And I'm just uh, curious what we can do to uh, push the developer to finishing that, uh, that location. Uh, I guess I'll start with the city manager. Mr. Fajot. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thanks for the question, Mayor. Um, and Senior Civil Engineer Kango has left the, left the meeting, but uh, she has been working continuously with uh, that very same developer, Taylor Morrison, who uh, is uh, responsible for those improvements. Uh, we're hearing from them that they intend to complete that work this construction season. Uh, don't have a specific start date yet, but we are pushing for that. There is uh, a bit of a holdup at the moment with uh, a, a PG&E vault that was in the roadway uh, that, that needs to be adjusted. So uh, we're they are pushing PG&E to complete that work. And uh, when that happens, we'll have a, a more firm schedule. But uh, Ms. Kango has done a, a fine job in, in continuing to push for that. And the latest that we've heard is that we expect that work to actually get done this construction season. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so with that, I'll uh, ask if uh, Vice Mayor Hannon has any comments tonight. Yes, uh, Mayor. Again, I want to echo Councilmember Bucci's comments regarding the candidate pool for the Planning Commission. Uh, some outstanding residents that want to continue to serve our community in a variety of capacities. As Mr. Bucci mentioned, there's other opportunities out there, and we'll certainly hope that they'll avail themselves of those opportunities. But I also want to take a moment, Mayor, to thank Karen Bridges for her many, many years of service to our community. I had the opportunity to sit with Karen on the Planning Commission. She's very thoughtful. She does her homework. She understands the issues. She understands the vision of our community. And she's always been a staunch supporter of the direction that we have strived to improve the overall quality of our community. So I just want to commend Karen Bridges for her outstanding service to our community. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, thank you. And uh, Council Member Bucci. Uh, nothing tonight. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Member Freitas. Thank you, Eleanor. Just one quick uh, thing for the public directors for sure. Mr. Fajot, today uh, we ha I had a meeting with ACTC and we have a new uh, chair, John Bowers, the mayor of Emmerville, and the uh, M and L Sortis, it's the uh, vice chair. So Mr. Bowers uh, mentioned today he likes to visit the districts uh, for be served in the next month. We'll contact the the commissioner. So maybe will be a good, he likes to tour in the the district. So I think it will be a good idea if we invited them for the a little walk in the future. Uh, overpass on Central Avenue. So have that in consideration if you'd like to join me because you'll be calling, but I think it'll be a great opportunity at least for, and any other items you'd like to put them on the table for him because he is very interesting to visit the locally, the the needs of the community. So maybe have that in mind when he, he contacted me, I can refer him to you or so and you can go from there, right? Thank you very much, Councilmember Bridges. Yeah, happy to happy to assist with the tour in any way we can. We have a a number of improvements we'd like to get uh, outside funding for uh, above and beyond the Central Avenue overpass. Thank you. Okay, 
Okay, and uh, okay, Council Member Coyazo. Well, thank you, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in uh, Mexico, the roundabouts, they're called glorietas, and they just have some beautiful, beautiful roundabouts. And that's why I think I've been so persistent that our roundabouts sh should look beautiful. I'm not going to say it's going to be to the extent like they do in Mexico, because in Mexico they do statues and all kinds of these things, kind of like in Paris, I believe. I've never been to Paris, but I've seen some of their roundabouts in some of the movies. And um, that's why I'm so persistent that I'd like our, our roundabouts to, to look beautiful. But on the other hand, I'd like to say that, you know, we've always been so honored with all our volunteers. You know, you've always said at all our our uh, state of the cities, how many hours these volunteers put in. And Karen Bridges is one of those persons. Uh, we served together on the library thing and um, we would drive together, whether it be to Pleasanton or Fremont to wherever we need, Castro Valley, we'd end up getting lost. But we always had these beautiful little chats together. It was a, been a pleasure to to serve with her and and uh, you know be her companion on all these um, little ventures that we would do for our meetings. So one last thing: we have so many volunteers. We have a great city. Let's keep it that way and shop Newark. All right. Thank you. So item H is closed session and uh, the closed session will not be held this evening and will be rescheduled for a future meeting. So with that, uh, we are adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.